Okay, um, so welcome everybody to this is now the sixth lecture of this series on volume one of Marx's Capital. And what we're going to be doing this time is looking at chapters 10 and 11 of the volume, which cover the question of absolute surplus value. This are the sort of main points that I'll be looking at. I am going to do a brief introduction this week. It's kind of like a reintroduction. And I will quickly um, go over the content of last time because I think it it bears it it's worth doing that. And then I'll look at the two chapters and uh, have some comments at the end. So just in terms of introduction, uh, what we've done is we've looked at uh, circulation in terms of the circulation of commodities and the circulation of money. And if you, I'm sure you all do remember these two different circuits, uh, one which starts with money and ends with more money, and one which starts with a commodity and ends with a commodity of the same value. Now, these two circuits are actually applied by Marx to the question of the sale and purchase of labour power. So he moves from circulation into production, and the way he does it is uh, that capital is seeking a commodity which has got this special uh, use value, which it, is that it can create more value. And so for capital, the movement into production is uh, an expansion of this commodity C. So you end up, you, but the capitalist buys labor power, creates new commodities and sells them for, for, for more money. And thus they end up with more money. And that's the idea that Marx has, that money is just not uh, a means of exchange in this relationship. It's a social relationship in which money is really expanding capital. Now, the one thing I want to sort of highlight here, because we'll come on to it, is the labour market isn't only about capital, it's about the workers. And the workers enter into the labour market to sell their labour power, or we'll see, to have their labour power sold for them in some cases. Um, and they exchange that for money, which will be the wage for a, a waged worker, and they will buy commodities with it. And so they will reproduce their own labor power. So you have within the class relation of the buying and selling of labor power, two different circuits. Okay. But once we get into production, then there is a second exchange which takes place between capital and labor, which is in the production of value and surplus value. And so Marx has got a very connected uh, three concepts, the distinction between labor power as a commodity and the use to which capital puts it in production, which is as labor activity creating more value. And then because it's creating value, it's possible to extend that to surplus value. So this is all sort of, what's the word, revision. And what Marx is now going to do this is so far, is he's going to, uh, from this general concept of surplus value, his initial outline, he's going to introduce two and arguably three, but certainly two different aspects to surplus value. I almost said types of surplus value, and that's one of the, the issues of interpretation, actually, because these, in my view, are two different ways of increasing surplus value. And, and should be better understood as such. But certainly in, in Marx's own work and a lot of literature, they are understood as, if you like, related but separate concepts of absolute surplus value and relative surplus value. Okay, so I, I'm hoping that this uh, is fairly familiar to you. I am gonna revi review uh, what I, I say about reading Capital. And basically, I mean, I'm taking a pedagogical approach in, in the lectures and trying as best I can to explain the theoretical and conceptual aspects. And we started off looking at the value and value form, and now we're looking at surplus value. And according to how, you know, one thinks about these things, I mean, certainly sometimes the algebraic expressions of this can be challenging. So I, I'm, you know, trying to help with that. I do uh, make a couple of methodological points, which is um, Marx makes a, a repeatedly makes a lot of use of the dialectical forms or categories such as abstract and concrete, essence and appearance. I mean, these come up time and time again in, when we're reading Marx, and it can help in your understanding to be looking for those and to think, be thinking about that. 
but also the Marxist sense of dialectics isn't only about if you like specific categories or formulae for uh, understanding categories of thought. It's also a sense of a dialectical system. Uh, so understanding the whole and how the parts fit with the whole. And this is very much uh, my reading of Capital and it's to sort of emphasize that uh, looking at volume one does give us a, a foundation in production, but we haven't finished the job. We have to follow Marx into circulation of capital and then in volume in volume two and then into volume three, where we see how circulation and production work together in the capitalist system. So, uh, so we have a sense of system within each volume, but within each volume, it's if like a partial sense of the totality. And then um, my third uh, aspect of the way I presenting this, and this will come out certainly in today's lecture, is I have a really, I mean, as many do, of course, many of us do have an extremely high appreciation of Marx's fantastic intellectual achievement. But I do look at it with a critical note in terms of um, broadening the scope of some of the conceptualizations, uh, especially when we're talking about who are, who are the laboring subject in the capitalist mode of production. And I think it's quite important that we develop the theoretical critique as well as the political challenge to capitalism on those grounds. Okay. Um, now, some of these points apply in what we're gonna be looking at now, which is why I'm sort of restating them. In the chapters that we'll be looking at, um, Marx makes an overall comment about how he moves, how the thought uh, categories move through the three volumes. And he does say in a sort of fairly epigrammatic way that it's a movement from the abstract to the concrete. That's broad brush. And actually, in my view, it's quite important that that's qualified. And we will see that in when we look at chapter 10. In chapter 10, it's not an abstract discussion. Uh, it's very much an empirical discussion, or if you like, um, a social historical review of uh, class relations of exploitation and of class struggle. And I would say the workers' voice uh, comes through here more than in probably any other part. Uh, certainly, um, you know, he, Marx gives some attention, he could give more, arguably, but he certainly gives some attention. Now, his main focus is on capital. He, in this chapter, he gives real, you know, he, it's important to him to bring out what the workers are fighting for, what the workers are saying about the struggle as well. So, up to now, when we've talked about history and capitalism, it's been, again, quite broad brush. So we've been generally speaking about history, the becoming of capitalism, the genesis of the capitalist mode of production. What we'll see in these chapters is a strong sense of history within the capitalist mode of production, how the capitalist mode of production develops, especially in the context of, of England in the first half of the 19th century. So. Uh, Marx is switching his level of abstraction. The chapters seven to nine, which we just finished, uh, are general uh, and fairly abstract in the way they treat relations. And he's going to switch this in, in chapter 10. It's going to be very much a sort of narrative uh, style. Uh, in chapter 11, he switches back to the sort of theoretical conceptualization. I say narrative. The narrative is not strictly sequential um, so if you wanted to get a sense of history I mean I will cover it but if you wanted to read forward uh, section six is actually the clearest chronology of what Marx is talking about which is the succession of different factory acts so over about a 25 year period okay now in my view in my interpretation when Marx comes back to the conceptual having looked at the uh, various aspects of class struggle I think against the wealth of material which he's brought to us as, as his readers, his conceptualization of it is quite, it narrows it. And, and in fact, it could be developed further conceptually to um, support, um, develop the diversity which he's explained within the, an overall unity of exploitation of the working class. So I will come back to that point. Um, this is a bit like uh, 20 yards of linen equals one coat, which you looked at a lot in, in chapter one. This is now probably, I hope, quite familiar to you. 
this uh, is an example which Marx uses two examples. This is a sort of leading one um, that he uses in chapter seven, eight and nine. And so we have an individual worker who's paid three shillings a day. Uh, they're a spinner, they spin cotton, uh, they use a machine. And so the sort of the items of expenditure which the capitalist has who employs this worker adds up to 27 shillings. And the cotton yarn which is spun has a value. Uh, and if it's sold at that value, that value is 30 shillings. So it's simple arithmetic and certainly capitalist bookkeeping will, will tell him that he's paid 27 shillings and he's received 30 shillings once he's sold the cotton yarn. So he's made a profit of three shillings. And Marx's theory is basically to show where that profit comes from. And as Marx explains, it comes from surplus value. So a capitalist is, sees this type of material, you know, this is sort of how they understand their own reality, right? So this is costs and they're paid for in money and they're elements of the capital that's been advanced. And on the right hand side, he knows, because otherwise why would he bother doing it, that the money received is greater than the capital advanced. Okay, um, what the capitalist does not recognize and clearly not in his class interest to recognize is what the source of this extra money, which he will take as profit is. And exactly what Marx is proving is the source of it is surplus value produced by the workers. Now, again, this is review. You saw this uh, picture before. We have the sort of material elements of production, the workers, the cotton, the machinery, they all go into production, which is controlled by capital. This capital, capital commands this process, okay? It's got the power over the elements in, in a social sense, at least, and the yarn is produced. Now, Marx looks at this in terms of the valorization of capital, the production of surplus value, which is the way capital reproduces itself in production, okay? And he divides the, um, the investments uh, in the capital advance into two categories according to their role in producing value. So this is capital, which is uh, paid for the commodity labor power, the labor power, which are the workers do the work and it's them that create the new value. So indirectly, the capital outlaid on the workers wages is the source of the new value. It's actually the workers that create new value, but I mean, it's a sort of a mediation. It's that element of capital which pays the wages, which the workers then do the work. So it's indirectly uh, the source of, this, to, of the new value. And then of course, Marx groups together for this purpose, at least the raw materials and the wear and tear of the machinery. It's used in production. It transfers uh, uh, value, but it, by creating, helping to create the new use value, but it doesn't add any new value. And that's why Marx calls this constant capital. So in our example of the 27 shillings advanced for paying the worker, that would be the three shillings variable capital and constant capital, a combination of the raw materials and the wear and tear, 24 shillings, okay? Now, in these chapters, and again, I am doing quite a heavy review here, but I think this, these are so fundamental points of class exploitation that Marx has established, right? Which is that variable capital is exchanged for labor power, and it's the labor power set to work that actually creates the new value. The labor power commanded by capital works longer than the time required to produce the equivalent, the equivalent value of labor power. Otherwise, there would be no surplus value. And we had that sort of dramatic moment where the, the capitalist sort of pulls a face and so on and so forth, right? So we hear the voice of the capitalist uh, bewailing the fact that they put in all this effort and yet they have no surplus value. So for capital, the workers must work longer than the time necessary for them to reproduce the value of their own labor power. And this time marks fairly, fairly usefully calls necessary labor time. Okay, now beyond this point, there's a real but invisible uh, production of surplus labor. So we go beyond this point, the labor is surplus for what the worker requires, but it's a source of what the capitalist requires. Okay, and this is objectified in the commodity. All of this is about commodity production. 
and remember the commodity doesn't declare itself as being so many hours of social labor it, it, it has the form of a price okay so strictly speaking the capitalist hasn't paid for the surplus labor what they've paid for when they pay the wages is for the opportunity to extract the surplus labor so they have to make the worker work longer than the six hours or necessary labor time so what they've done is they've hired disposal of the workers labor power and the command over that for a working day now the length of the working day has to be extended beyond what is necessary for the worker to re render surplus value for the capitalists again this so far it's all review uh, and i think hopefully it's sort of quite firmly firmly established in, in our minds okay now this seems a bit more technical but it is actually really important in the way this relation between capital and labor is actually expressed and marx uh, writes about two ratios which are distinct but connected okay this is a, again it's a sort of a very standard dialectical category they're not separate but neither are they the same right and the one which is the rate of surplus value reveals a contradiction whereas the second the return on capital advance hides that contradiction right and the contradiction is that between the surplus labor time and the necessary labor time so this ratio what marx calls s over v is normally expressed in money terms so the surplus value has to be expressed in money terms in our example that would be the three shillings surplus value the workers produced in a day and their wages have to be expressed uh sorry and the their variable capital the wages that's also three shillings so what we have then is a ratio in money terms of three shillings over three shillings which is 100 percent and Marx uh, explains that you can also see the source of this in the process of producing this is the ratio of surplus labor to necessary labor. So this proportion represents the degree to which the worker is being exploited by the capitalist. And what's fundamental about it is that the focus the con concentration is on the workers fundamental contribution as the creator of the value and their exploitation even though they are the creator of new value okay now if you look at the second equation it looks very similar the difference isn't in the top line it's still looking at surplus value in a ratio but the ratio here is with the total capital advanced all right so this is the constant capital plus the variable capital in our example we still got the surplus value of three shillings but we remember now it's very firmly lodged in our minds uh, that what we the capitals expended was 24 for the constant and three for the variable c plus v that's 27 and if you do the sort of simple arithmetic that's that would be that ratio comes out at just over 11 percent Marx gives another example at this point in his text, and he has, uh, you know, it's on a bigger scale. It's not an individual worker; it's a collective, collectivity of workers. And that other example comes out at 18%. But you notice this: uh, the percentage, the numbers are very different. 100% rate of surplus value, 11%, 18%. Uh, uh rate of profit which is what this is called but what marx has now done is it explained where this delta m which came came to back to capital as money capital in circulation where it comes from in production he's already established the basic relationships between production and circulation and the more fundamental one is that this value is created in production and it's created by the workers who are exploited in production but when you look at return on capital advanced that exploitation if you only look at that that exploitation disappears because actually this is how capital sees it uh, it sees that it's invested money, it's advanced capital, sees that it ends up with more money, and the, diff the ratio between the two, the delta M over the M, uh, is 3 over 27, 11.1%. Uh, so this delta M over M is the appearance of this relationship here. 
Okay, but what Marx has done is he's deepened our understanding of what lie behind the relationship through his analysis of the, these different elements, relationships between surplus value, constant capital, variable capital. So he, he has explained how this comes about. Okay, it's a deeper understanding and it's an understanding from a class perspective. Okay, so it includes the capitalist uh, sort of uh, superficial knowledge, uh, but also critiques it. Okay, so there we have these two ratios. They, they actually turn out to be very important. This distinction it will run through. Marx will come back to this. He'll come back to it when he looks at how the capitalist system as a whole works in Volume Three. At the moment, he's only looking at individual capitalists, if you like, standing for the system as a whole. And there's a big issue about how that becomes a totality as a system as a whole and that's what Marx addresses in volume three and it's a very contradictory process he, he begins to he really sort of addresses directly later on now the other sort of uh, slight brain teaser that Marx gives us is this other one um, which is how you can conceive the value of the commodity product and what he does is he says well uh, we've got this 30 shillings and we know that's the cotton yarn but we also know where it came from okay so we can say that is the value of the yarn 20 pounds of yarn are worth 30 shillings okay but we can also say well that is the c the constant plus the v the variable plus the surplus the s 24 plus 3 plus 3. so one can conceive of the value of the commodity as a product through the lens of its constituent elements that went into creating the value okay now this is slightly subtle maybe or might even think you know worse than subtle rather sort of like what's the point um obsessive right but earlier on in the chapters you've been looking at right at the very beginning he actually writes this in two different ways and one way of writing this c plus v plus s is just to put c and v together plus s. So what we're talking about here is the 27 shillings plus the three shillings. Now, I hope from what I've said already, this is actually more or less how the capitalists view it. You know, it's the money advance, they have spent it on different elements, and they end up with three shillings. Okay. And this is a purely formal notation, which picking out, if you read it this way, lends itself to this type of understanding, okay, which is the capitalist view of capital advance plus surplus value or profit. Now, if we bracket it the other way, again, it's just a formal little exercise here. Instead of C plus V plus S, we have C plus V plus S. I mean, so what? So what's the difference? Well, it, the constant, it brings out this distinction between what's passive in terms of the valorization of capital and what's active. That's the point. So what you have here is 24 constant again. I mean, the actual numbers haven't changed. It's, it's the, the qualitative relation or how they work together is being brought out differently. Now the six here is the new value. Okay, now remember when the worker works, they actually replace the equivalent of the variable capital in the first part of their working day, the necessary labor time. And then they continue working and create the surplus value. You take those two together and what they are, are just two component parts of the total of the value created by the worker during the working day. So this is uh, this notation just brings that more to the fore, okay? So it seems very formal, but it, again, it's actually a very important point. Now, uh, this is my diagrammatic expression of exactly everything I've been saying. Uh, so if we start off on the left hand side, this is the capital advance. It's very much like our little list of items we had already. Now on the right hand side, we have C, constant capital plus the new value added, which we can also express as V plus S. Okay, so that would be 30 shillings. It's still 30 shillings. We're just decomposing it more. Okay. So the product can be expressed in value terms like this. Okay. Now, what Marx is also saying is that this 
S over V, this ratio, the three shillings over the three shillings, corresponds to the surplus labor time over the necessary labor time. It's the same uh, proportion, but expressing the time relationship within the working day and expressing the value relationship or what's been produced during the working day. Now, the assumption through all of this is a sort of like a homogeneous rate of value production during the working day. Okay, so as the working day goes through, this, if this is a 12 hour working day. Uh, at the end of the day, there's 30 shillings been produced. So again, the arithmetic really, we're producing new value at the rate, of, uh, we're producing value, the total value is getting produced at the rate of 2.5 shillings a day, uh, an hour, sorry. Now this is exactly uh, the rule of thumb point which Marx is throwing in. And this is just a little uh, tester for us. To, to make sure we understand what's going on here, right? So he talks about this rule of thumb by the, cap, by the manufacturer, who in, instead of dividing the product uh, through, through this sort of device of C plus V plus S, which Marx uses a lot, by the way, this will come up time and time again, as you go through the whole of the three volumes of capital, you'll become very familiar with C plus V plus S, right? But he, this is a sort of a side point but it allows him to bring out, bring out something important, right? And he says, well, mate, what the capitalist actually does is they think of the working day itself and subdivide that into the same proportions. So uh, if you've produced a 20 pound of cotton in 12 hours, then, uh, and it's worth 30 shillings, then the capitalist can say, well, I'm, you know, my unit, my production unit is producing value at the rate of two and a half shillings in each hour. And then he can decompose that and say, well, I've made three shillings profit. So where, what, it, when does my profit get made? Well, it gets made in the last bit of time because all the rest of it is just producing the 27 shillings that are spent. It's actually slightly more than an hour. The numbers don't fall out neatly, but in the last hour and 12 minutes is when this three shillings uh, profit gets produced. And, and it's a rule of thumb and it's a sort of semi-intuition of what the source of the profit is, the surplus value. But uh, what Marx is actually saying is, again, it hides a distinction between the element that creates the value and the element whose value is transferred. And so he comes back to his point about concrete and abstract labor, and he makes very clear that labor creates the new value and it's um, at the same time, which is this red line here, creating new value at the same time, it's transferring the value from the elements of constant capital. So you, were you to add these two up, you'd end up with that basically. So at the rate of two shillings an hour, a value is being transferred and at the rate of half a shilling an hour, new value is being created. Okay, I know that's quite a lengthy review, but I think it is so foundational that I, I did decide to spend time going over it again. Mm. So what we've got here now is the new material which builds on that. The very last point he makes, and I think uh, you were familiar with it, the so-called seniors last hour. That's the, that's, the, that's the origin of this idea that you need to add. And so what the capitalist knows is if they add more hours on here, then they're gonna get more profit. They're gonna get more out of production. Uh, so they, they, from a superficial level of re, uh, reasoning, they come up with the, the point that matters for them, right? Which is keep the workers working for longer, we're gonna make more profit. And so Marx talks about the working day from that starting point. So it's a sort of like an imperative, a motive, if you like, for capital to continually keep on pushing for a longer working day because then that will get more surplus value. Yeah. Marx doesn't actually use the term absolute surplus value till a bit later on in his text in chapter 12. And he contrasts it with the, the other type of surplus value. He looks at their relative surplus value but what is really important is that he's led us to the point where we can see it's very clear that this is a way of increasing surplus value, which is by increasing the length of the working day. So he starts off chapter 10 with this, with this illustration, which is supremely clear, I think, actually, which is if AB is your six hours uh, and a worker works for seven hours in their working day, 
uh, then, and he does the sums over here, then there's one extra hour, one surplus labor time. And if you look at the ratios, that ends up at being just over 16%. So the rate of surplus value is 16%, S over V, okay? Uh, make the workers work longer, uh, three hours extra. So they're working a nine hour working day. Then the ratio between the surplus labor time and the necessary labor time is increased up to 50%. In his day, uh, the norm was more like 12 hours. And so you have the necessary labor time of six hours, the surplus labor time of each dash is an hour of, of six hours. So the ratio of surplus time to necessary time, 100%, okay. Um, now, the question is, who decides how long the working days, right? And that's really what most of this discussion is about. Uh, that follows on from that. And I mentioned the worker's voice earlier. Marx does bring this in, and it is interesting. He, he sort of, I don't know if it summarizes, but he synthesizes it from an actual document he has from a building worker's manifesto, it's called at the time. Very useful footnote. I mean, it would be good to get hold of the original manifesto. So Marx sort of summarizes the worker's voice from this, and he says, look, uh, you said you're going to do a deal with me and that you will pay me a, 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 a fair price for my labor power but the workers here are saying you're making me work longer than is decent in order for me to maintain my labor power you're you're exhausting me through overwork so it's one thing you know sort of buying buying my uh, labor power and using it using it and it's quite another of buying my labor power and despoiling it I mean, you're despoiling me, basically, because you can't separate the worker from the labour power. And Marx goes into a, a discussion about uh, explaining how these workers were being prematurely, uh, they weren't exactly worked to death, they were, but they were worked to an early death in the sense that their life expectancy was massively reduced. And so they were burnt out after about 10 years or so. So the, the question of what is a labour power uh, is social as well as physical it, and it, I mean if anybody has had to work very long hours you you soon get to a state where you really feel you just can't recover you just need to take a break well these workers weren't allowed a break and they were kept on you know working basically so the labor power is not only on a daily basis or a monthly basis it's it's uh, it's what is the capacity for somebody to work over their working life and um so what happens is who decides and what Marx really highlights is well the class struggle decides there's no sort of correct answer to this in that sense right uh, it's a battle of wills and in this battle of wills it's a matter of uh, force because you can say both sides in this battle have uh, have an argument to make about exchange uh, you know their right in the contract right the workers saying well you pay for my late you know my labor power which you shouldn't be exhausting and the capitalist saying no i paid for my right to exhaust you basically to command you for a full working day so this is a this is a battle there's no two ways about it it's a direct confrontation it's a struggle over what the limit should be to a working day and marx is incredibly clear about this and and helpfully so i think right now this second section of the chapter the title doesn't quite fully convey what the content is. He does start with the boyars, who are the noblemen in Russia, who got their laborers. Um, they cheated them and got a lot more extra work from them through the corvée system than they, you know, the, they were supposed to, um, formally speaking. But there's a sort of red bracket here. I'll put it in because there's actually a bit of this content. This chapter is not reflected in the title. Marx does uh, take one of several looks at slavery in this chapter at this point, and he does distinguish between the overwork of antiquity and the, the possibility that slaves could be worked to death, depending right um, through overwork and the fact that when you bring this mode of uh, he, he calls it a mode of production, but in the narrow sense, I would say mode of exploitation, right? Um, but when this is in modern times, uh, specifically in, in the US here, uh, you can, he says, well, basically, there is a motive for, for, for the working to death of the enslaved laborer, the African laborer, right? And that's what happens. The overworking of the Negro uh, 
fever within seven years, right? So the motive here is the production of surplus value. So this is a sort of a hybrid uh, type of capitalism where still the motive is to extract and to realize surplus value from this quote. The, the, um, there are these sort of side uh, illustrations which come back in and out, but the main core of the narrative is about the factory acts in England. And uh, uh, he's saying by 1850, the working day had been limited, the working week had been limited to 68 hours or 60 hours with breaks. And there's an awful lot in the chapter of, of factory inspectors writing the reports about different ways in which the capitalists were trying to work around the, the terms of the successive factory acts. Okay. Um, and one of the, in 1850 now, um, you had children under 13 who were still working and you had young people, which is 13 to 18, uh, working. Uh, and we'll come back to that, how much they had to work. So I've already mentioned this and you can follow it up. The footnote is quite right for Marx to Engels, uh, working class in England. I mean, at this time, uh, there was a mass workers movement in England uh, and it peaked around this time in 1848. It wasn't. Uh, revolutionary challenge, um, such as the English way, you might joke, uh, might think, uh, because we've been a bit short of revolutionary challenges on these islands, right? But uh, it was sufficiently uh, powerful to force a degree of reform. And at that moment, it turned out that at that moment, the ruling class was split over the free trade debate between the interests of manufacturers and landowners. So you ended up with a kind of stalemate almost between the three different classes and impasse. And it's in that circumstance that the role of the factory inspectors became particularly prominent. And I think it was uh, uh, quite a lot of particularity to the circumstance. For some interpreters, uh, the agency has shifted very much to these decent, uh, people who are the factory inspectors. I think there's quite a few clues behind it. And I think it could have been a bit more explicit that there was an awful lot of class struggle which brought this situation about. Um, right. Now, this is a really interesting section because I've talked about the Factory Act and it's literally was factory acts, right? So there are loads of branches of production industries which weren't covered by the Factory Acts. And uh, so Marx looks into this quite a lot. And what he looks at is potteries, manufacturing matches, bakery, railwaymen, milliners, blacksmiths, lots of different, if you like, workshop type environments, generally speaking, where there were no protections for children uh, that had been uh, in, included in the first set of the Factory Acts, right? And so these a lot of witness statements, a lot of material about the conditions which the children had to endure. And basically, the such really stunted growth, bad health, uh, because of overworking and long hours. So you do have the role of the states coming in here in limiting exploitation of the working class, or not, because in these branches there was not any limitation. Right? You have long hours with destroying workers' lives. There's an awful lot about the health and safety conditions. So the 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 degree of exploitation isn't only about money, it's about how oppressive the conditions were, okay? Now, there are parts of this where Marx quotes, um, contrasting the conditions of the workers, especially the children uh, and, the, and, the, and the younger people in England and saying, you know, well, it could be even be worse than what has happened in, in the Americas, either the First Nations or to enslaved people. I think that um, he's not right about that, uh, but I think it's more to highlight the hypocrisy of the sort of manufacturing liberals who were supposedly uh, against slavery, but yet they were treating their own workers in such a hor horrible way. Okay. Now, there is another point which is not directly from Marx, but I want to bring it in because it serves my sort of broader argument. It's interesting what liberals do think exploitation is, right? Because they do say, you know, that uh, children and other people working under oppressive conditions, under excessive conditions, that's what exploitation is. But what they don't say is that, if you like, the normal degree 
of wage labor under capitalism is exploitation. So that, that's the sort of the liberal view. What Marx uh, develops beyond the normal degree of exploitation is what they say is exploitation. Okay. Marx uses a, a term, I think it's in the quote there, either still unfettered, right? So he's, he's talking about an unfettered exploitation. Uh, but also uh, what I think we need to do is to take this idea of unfettered, explo unfettered exploitation and relate it to the concept of surplus value. Now, this one is um, section four, uh, the shift system, which came in very heavily at the time in the early period of the cotton industry. And then in those industries which had a big investment in constant capital, especially steel making. So in order to sort of lever the, the constant capital, a lot of shift working. And it is very striking in this section, how much of the night shifts were actually staffed by young people and uh, mostly boys, sometimes girls, right? So what you have is incredible amounts of overwork through, through the shift system. And you also have a slight uh, counterfactual to the idea that each laborer is free to sell their own labor power. Um, because actually there were examples parents were essentially selling their children into the factories uh, as a form of subcontracting. Okay. Now this section is a struggle for the normal working day. Um, again, uh, the title, does, I mean, there is a part of the content which isn't actually reflected in the title. And again, this part is what uh, Marx has, uh, he, he doesn't really give it a full analysis, but he, he brings out some really uh, important points about slavery, right? So he talks, uh, he talks about slavery as distinct uh, from wage labor. And he is actually talking about a labor market. So we've got two different categories of labor market being presented to us here, but not yet theorized, okay? And within the in labor market of enslaved Africans, which it, it was, uh, there's a distinction between the US South, where there's a sort of an internal market of the breeder state, so called in the East, and the more um, intense the cotton production in, in, the, in the South. Okay, so that's uh, one type of labor market. And then another type is, I mean, say it's a market I know is a bit, what's the word, um, anodyne in relation to what was really going on. But there is a there is a point here that which is that this is about it's a very, it was a very violent form of capitalist exploitation right so you had capital making profits uh, from the plantations so the second case is the international Atlantic slave trade where you know it allowed for uh, enslaved African workers to be worked to death even more quickly than that they were had, were in the United States which you know. That. So these are just uh, really they're just passing points in terms of Marx's theoretical development. He is more interested in free labor, wage labor, um, and he says in the development of free uh, labor, particularly he's looking at England basically mostly, right? And he says that there are two counter tendencies which took place. The first is in the late middle ages uh, coming into early days of capitalism capital fought for longer working days that was the major tendency to force the workers to work longer and that this took centuries and it became a sort of a, against the workers will but it took generation after generation for this to become the norm right it was it was fought against right uh, in various ways right? and then he says but then what happens in the with the factory acts is then there's a struggle to limit the working day sort of a counter tendency right now i think as a commentary that um to be truly general in a theory it has to include the first type as well as the second type i.e enslaved labor as well as wage labor so i'm getting about i'm about three quarters of the way through uh, very close maybe two thirds i think i'm going to go for probably a, a full hour i think the uh, struggle for the normal working day is the heart of this chapter in terms of us understanding what was going on and he really does explain this very in full detail and very well i mean he's at the height of his expressive powers here and what's interesting is um 
the focus around each factory act and what the way there was a to and and froing the workers were trying to take advantage of the limited protections they had they were assisted by the reports of the factory inspectors and yet at the same time the manufacturers were fighting back they were trying to find loopholes and ways to cheat the system they were actually rebelling in in if you like in practice against the law that had been passed and one of the ways they did this is through what's was known as the relay system so it was supposed to be a, a limited number of hours that young people could work say 12 hours so what they started to do is to put people in one position for two hours take a gap and then put them in another position for two hours so the work would have to be there for 15 hours but it would only add up to a, a 12 hour day now it's quite incredible because this is actually very similar to what happens in the gig economy today i mean it is remarkably similar except it was taking place inside the factory rather than say for um i mean i have heard that um wait waiters and waitresses in south africa they only get paid for the time in which they're actually walking up to the table and taking an order of course that's you know that means they cut their wages to in half basically um so what we have is a series of acts 1844 1847 which is known as the 10 hours act right and again um the capitalists found ways of subverting its uh, intention and getting the workers to be at their posts more or less uh, with some breaks here and there for 12 or 15 hours a day so this is uh, as i say marx explains this quite a lot uh, this type of thing is still going on in colombia you know what is the length of a working day it's still quite real i think in different parts of the world this type of struggle um these are general points we're getting close to the end of this chapter now this is the last section um he's he's writing here uh, very strongly and powerfully about capital's drive to increase uh, the working day in order to um increase surplus value and he says here even before we look at how capital reshapes the way work is done it's clear that the whole point is the production of surplus value so he's separating this aspect if you like from the technical revolutions which capital did bring in out of its own interest okay um and again i'm just making this point that i think there's some tension here actually i don't think marx develops this uh, tension but i think he's aware of it and he's he's expressing it here and the tension is between the concept of the labor subject as being a male independent worker right and on the other hand the reality of what modern industry was actually using as the workforce and so he talks about the employment of miners as being a particularly striking example of exploitation and that's kind of like as far as he gets with with that argument he doesn't take it further okay um so his main point is the sort of the drive for uh, a longer working day but all these sort of points of differentiation within that uh, are not really developed quite so much and again there's a major very good quote again about the uh situation in the united states at the end of the civil war um, and he does qualify what he means by free worker he's he's now sort of saying okay the worker is not really a free agent right they're a free agent for a moment and when they sell their labor power, but actually they're being subject to the power of capital um, in its domain if you like Right, I'm going to move, uh, jump that quickly just for time, but this, this is um, a shorter chapter, much shorter, and it's his, if you like, theoretical summation of where he's got so far. And so it builds very much on chapters six, uh, six, seven, and eight, no, seven, eight, and nine, and it's a, like a continuation of them. And we're back now at the level of um, sort of general, general laws, if you like, general relations. Okay. Uh, now he starts the chapter and again this is something I, I think we should be alert to right he starts the chapter again with the, the idea that the value of labor power uh, is assumed to be a given constant magnitude now this three shillings a day wages is a very realistic figure for male workers in the factories at the time but it's not a realistic figure for what women workers were paid or young people were paid and certainly not what children were paid so what you know, this degree of uh, differentiation is not is is already sort of not included 
in the way he, he assumes these general uh, laws now. He has three laws. The first law, um, pretty straightforward. Um, the mass of surplus value produced is equal to the amount of variable capital advanced multiplied by the rate of surplus value. Okay. And that means that the number of workers, you have more workers producing the same degree of exploitation is gonna produce more surplus value, okay? And then the second one is that there is a limit to the working day. And therefore it's there, this is a quite important one actually in terms of how capitalism develops. Therefore uh, you can't um, compensate uh, for a reduced variable capital by a higher rate of surplus value um, by increasing the exploitation labor power beyond a certain point. In other words, you know, once you get to, I mean, they took it to that point, say 15 hours a day. I mean, how much more can they go, right? If there are fewer workers being exploited, then you can't compensate for that lesser number beyond a certain point. You just can't, they can't be exploited anymore. Okay, is what he's saying there. Now, the third law is really interesting. And again, it's a seed for a much bigger discussion, which comes back in later on. He says, the masses of value and of surplus value produced by different capitals, the value of labor power being given and its degree of exploitation being equal. So that's like a brackets there. Vary directly as the amounts of the variable components of these capitals. So, all, I mean, in a way, this is really obvious. He's saying, that the amount of value in the surplus value produced varies according to how much, how many workers are being employed, how much living labor power is being put to work, the number of workers who are being exploited. And you, you kind of think, well, yeah, so that's pretty obvious. I mean, that's just about like basic arithmetic, right? But what follows from what he says there is actually the surprising point, right? He says that this law contradicts all experience based on immediate appearances. He's saying it's not the case that capitals who employ relatively more workers actually uh, gather in, if you like, appropriate more surplus value. And he goes on, everyone knows that a cotton spinner, who if we consider the percentage over the whole of his applied capital, so this cotton spinner is the capitalist cotton spinner, employs much constant capital and little variable capital does not, on account of this, pocket less profit or surplus value than a baker who sets in motion relatively much variable capital and little constant capital. So what's he saying here? He's saying, look, if you took your 27 shillings, in his example, three shillings went on wages and 24 shillings went on constant capital. Okay, so that's a high proportion of constant capital against variable capital. Uh, a lot of investment in the means of production compared to what's invested in the workers. But you can have other industries where maybe it's 50-50. So there's more workers being put in motion to create value by a given amount of the capital advance. There's a high proportion of variable capital uh, element part of the capital advance against the constant. And so he's saying, but when that happens, these two capitals will actually make, they're in different industries, that's important, right? Capitals in these two different industries will actually end up with the same amount of profit. That's what we find in practice. So this idea and this idea are in contradiction. And it's a contradiction which he uh, lets sort of like, uh, I don't know, bubble away if you like. Uh, and he comes back to it later on again in volume three. But it's really important to understand that Marx is creating a, you know, he's got a big arc as an author. He's, he's, he's sowing a seed when he's going to come back to this uh, very explicitly when he talks about the rate of profit and what the formation of the rate of profit. So later on, he separates the idea of surplus value that's produced from the profit that's realized at the level of an individual capital. Okay. And he says, basically, and he's right. I mean, economics before him never solved this problem. And in fact, most Marxist economics after him haven't solved the problem either, but that's another story. Um, all right, so some uh, final comments, right? The different examples extending the working day are also about premature exhaustion of the working class. 
So, and also around these factory acts, it's not only about the working day. It's about those sectors which are not covered by the acts. It's about those sections of the working class who are more oppressed and have you know, tougher co conditions for them as a result. And it, I haven't put this in the slide, but actually this allows capital to exploit the male workers more is, is a point that Marx makes here, right? Uh, but there is nonetheless uh, a, a pattern of inequality of sections within the working class. Uh, a differentiated degrees, perhaps even of exploitation. And this is not captured in the theoretical summation in chapter 11. Okay. He assumes a normal common rate of surplus value across all the different sections. So you have to ask the question, well, maybe that's justified. I mean, uh, clearly a lot, of, a lot of Marxists say quite strongly it is justified, right? Because at this level of abstraction, but what I say is at this level of abstraction, you can introduce these differences without sacrificing the basic theory. It's a matter of developing the theory, especially if these aren't just temporary, uh, you know, passing de deviations, if you like, divergences, but they're endemic structural capitalist social relations. There's a very important debate about absolute surplus value in Latin America, and it is the debate uh, about how far absolute surplus value explains a labor super exploitation. And the, the sort of the classical one is Marini's argument with Cardoso. Um, and Cardoso basically accused Marini's concept of super exploitation as just being the same as Marx's absolute surplus value. And we can see a lot of what Marx is writing about, you could put the label super exploitation on it without a doubt. I mean, very oppressive conditions, okay. Ex exhaustion of the working class, right? Um, now then, uh, Marini argues this is not the case. He says that what we've got is a distinct category here, which cannot, which, if you like, is a, on a different uh, dimension and involves both absolute and relative surplus value, but under different conditions, okay, than England in the mid 19th century. He also, um, there is also a point of view, uh, which is in the literature in Latin America, which is that Marx. The things that I've been mentioning uh, along the way constitute a theory of super exploitation. Um, and then there's another position, which I would say is certainly the predominant position on the what you might call the Euro -mar Eurocentric Marxism, which is didn't need, we don't, Marx didn't need, and we don't need a theory of super exploitation uh, because uh, he wasn't working at that level of abstraction. Uh, and it, that belongs to something which is more concrete and specific, maybe given societies, right? What I uh, what I've tried to show is actually Marx was working at different levels of abstraction in this in these chapters, and it's a matter of how you theorize the empirical material and, and it, uh, if like consolidate it in theoretical categories. So I really don't accept that argument at all, right? Um, yeah, and so we need to develop the concept of surplus value. Finally. Um, I think um, it's a long chapter. Uh, I think the first uh, two sections should be read in full. I would like the reading group just to think about whether or not you can just accelerate a little bit by uh, and just try a different technique. I'm not insisting on this by any means, but I'm just a little bit concerned about some of the material is quite sort of discursive historical narration, and maybe it's possible to summarize it and just cover a bit more ground uh, but yeah it's let's let's see what works and these are some of my suggested uh, for the readings uh, it's certainly not exhaustive and that's the next lecture and finally that's just a plug because this is uh happening today certainly in places like south africa historically in uh britain and coming back with a gig economy certainly in britain and similar countries and very much the norm in countries like South Africa. Okay, uh, that's me. Uh, uh, we can stop the recording now and invite people to join, join in the, the chat.